third and last day, PUT Symposium. We will have two sessions this morning. One before 10.30 and another after 11, up to 1300 hours. We'll have a closing ceremony just after uh, the second session. And that is just before we have lunch and um, we say our goodbyes during lunch. Except of course for those who have plans to visit Rwanda. Remember it's a weekend, so this is your opportunity to explore our country over the weekend. So this morning, we'll begin with a session titled The Impact of Emerging Digital Technologies on the Economy, Diplomacy, and Security in Africa, to be moderated by uh, Colonel Patrick Nyirishema. Colonel Patrick Nyirishema is the head of research and development in the, in the Ministry of Defense. He previously served as the Director General of Rwanda Utilities and Regulatory Authority, a multi-sector regulator which covers a number of utilities including ICT, transport, energy, water, among others. He, ac he actively participated in the development and implementation of Rwanda's national ICT policy and plans, serving as Deputy Director General of Rwanda Information Technology Authority, and later at the Rwanda Development Board, successively as Deputy CEO in charge of ICT and head of ICT department. He held various responsibilities as an officer in the RDF. He is an alumni of the Rwanda Defense Force Command and Staff College. His education background is in the field of electronics and computer engineering. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Patrick Nyirishema. Thank you, MC, for the kind introduction. The commandants, generals, senior officers, uh, the honorable minister, and the other panelists that we have this morning. It's truly a privilege and an honor for me to be uh, moderating this uh, session today. Um, since we have started uh, about uh, 20 minutes late, I will not go into too much of an introduction that I would have wished to make. Uh, allow me to straight away invite our panelists. Um, I'll start with uh, the Honorable Minister Paula Ingabire, Minister of ICT and Innovation for Rwanda. Minister Paula uh, has been in the ICT sector for Rwanda for more than 10 years. Uh, she is uh, serving on a number of international boards, uh, most notably the World Summit Award Board uh, of Directors. She's on the WEF Cybersecurity Board and also the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Global Network Advisory Board. She is a, a graduate from the Kiel Institute of Science and Technology as well as MIT in the U.S. I uh, also like to add that she's uh, played a key role in the development uh, and growth of the Smart Africa. Please join me in welcoming Minister Paula. Uh, the second panelist I'm going to call is uh, Dr. Hamadoun Toure. Dr. Hamadoun Toure um, has served in many capacities in the private sector, in government, uh, as well as international organizations. Uh, he's uh, the first and only African to head the International Telecommunication Union as a Secretary General. This is, by the way, the oldest uh, international organization which celebrated 150 years, uh, I think, two days ago. 
He also uh, served as a minister of uh, econ digital economy and communication in Mali. Uh, he was also the founding executive director of Smart Africa. And uh, we're looking forward to drawing from his experience in all those organizations uh, to bring to life uh, the topic we're discussing today. Dr. Amadun Ture, please come to the stage. Please join me in welcoming him. The next panelist I'm going to call to stage is uh, Mr. Sanjun Rati. Uh, she is a CEO and founder of Cyber Diplomat. She is uh, an active researcher in cyber diplomacy. And this organization is based out of Bangalore in India, but also operates in the US, in Africa, Latin America. She's very passionate about uh, cyber in general and uh, cyber diplomacy in particular. And we'll be looking forward to hearing her perspectives, especially the impact of emerging technologies on diplomacy. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Last, but by no means uh, least, I'd like to call uh, Brigadier General Yossi Kopenwasa. He is uh, currently the head of the Institute for Research of Intelligence Methodology at the Israeli Intelligence Community Commemoration and Heritage Center. Please, since you're already standing, come to the, <laughs> to the stage. <laughs> he has uh, a very long career that spans in the area of uh, military intelligence, diplomacy, and international affairs. And uh, we're looking forward to drawing from his experience in teasing out, uh, especially the security aspect of the topic we're discussing today. So uh, the topic we're going to be discussing is the impact of emerging digital technologies on the economy, diplomacy, and security in Africa. Uh, this is uh, obviously a broad topic, and uh, we're going to get into it. Uh, we have an excellent panel that is going to help us tease out some of the key aspects and hopefully bring this topic to life uh, for the audience and also looking uh, forward to a lively uh, discussion after we've had uh, from the panelists. The way we're going to proceed is as follows. Uh, I'll call upon the Honorable Minister to uh, open uh, with her remarks. She will give us a broad overview uh, of this topic and uh, probably help us understand what we mean when we say emerging digital technologies, but also their impact uh, in a broad sense. Uh, next, we'll uh, hear from uh, General Yossi. Uh, he will focus mostly on the impact uh, on security uh, because we're looking at Imagine these are technologies, the impact on economy, diplomacy, and security. The general will be, of course, sharing insights about the topic in general, but uh, specifically focus on the security, uh, the impact on security. After that, we'll hear from Sanjuna Rati. Uh, I should be ad addressing as Her Excellency, she's, since she's a diplomat, a cyber diplomat. And uh, she will help us tease out uh, key aspects of cyber diplomacy and why we should care about it. And lastly, we hear from Dr. Amadun Ture. As I explained, he has a, a wide experience spanning across uh, the private sector, government, intergovernment organizations. He's been at the helm of the uh, ITU, which is an international organization that helps work with countries in the development of uh, digital technologies, uh, as well as having led the Smart Africa. So, he will help us bring everything together. On that note, once again, join me in a round of applause as we welcome Minister Pola. <laughs> All right, Minister, the floor is yours. You speak from where you are, yes. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you here today, and I understand you've had a um, very good set of conversations over the last uh, couple of days. So I hope we will also be able to live up to the expectations that have been set uh, over the last two days. 
perhaps I'll start off, um, since our topic is mainly around what the impact of emerging technologies is in terms of um, the economy when it comes to diplomacy as well as uh, security in Africa. But before I touch on those three parts, um, I wanted to just take a step back and really talk about what are these emerging technologies. Um, when, when you do a lot of research, and for most of you that are perhaps involved in, the, in one or the other in the tech sector, you will already see numerous examples of how digital technologies, emerging technologies have impacted uh, different facets and aspects of life. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has been, has been a very good um, uh, opportunity for us to really uh, push ourselves to see how best can we uh, really put to use these um, emerging technologies. But I think what is very clear uh, for all of us is that with emerging technologies, they do change the status quo. And the reality is that many of them are either still under development, their practical application hasn't been fully uh, perceived, it's evolving in nature. Uh, if you've been following uh, generative AI conversations, chat GPT, you know, the risks, the concerns, the excitement, the benefits, you can only imagine what the potential would be uh, in terms of really disrupting in a good way, but also in a bad way, the different uh, industries. But you can think of many from uh, quantum computing, IoT, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, drones. And I think today's conversation, very particularly the panel, will also be looking at how has this transformed um, you know, the, the, the African society when it comes to diplomacy, when it comes uh, to the economies as a whole. I'll give a few examples, and very particularly here in Rwanda but also looking at the security angle, which most of you um, are coming from. And perhaps let me start with the di diplomacy angle. I think what we continue to see is the powerful ability uh, for emerging technologies to really uh, change the diplomacy landscape. Uh, just very recently, last year, we saw what it really means to empower you know, individuals, corporations who can now uh, have a voice, have a say in diplomacy. It's no longer left to governments. And we are even seeing how it's disruptive in the sense that you have, uh, if you've been following the conversations around Twitter and how it was quiet and Elon Musk, we know all of that. And so these are really examples of what the power uh, of emerging technologies can do. But when we look at our policy landscape, even really bringing it home to this conversation around cybersecurity, you're really thinking about how are we uh, as countries coordinating to ensure you know, um, you know, policies around cybercrime, uh, policies around data protection and, and privacy are in place, because once you have this in place, then it provides a basis for engagement in some of the relevant international uh, pr processes that mainly are driven uh, from a dip diplomatic uh, perspective. And so this, in many ways, will show you how, uh, when you are very well prepared as a country, uh, when it comes to how we are leveraging emerging technologies, how we are embedding them and mainstreaming them in everything that we are doing, then you have a better voice and representation in how this is shaping uh, the global uh, diplom diplomatic landscape. Moving on to economy, I think on the economic side, we see many examples, if, if anything. Uh, I, I, I did tell you at the very beginning that I would be sharing how uh, we've been able to benefit from that here in Rwanda. A very clear example is how we've been able to use drone technologies uh, to deliver blood products and emergency health products to rural uh, hospitals and health facilities. And if I tell you a little bit about the story, when this happened, um, there were no globally agreed on set of regulations around drones. The company Zipline had uh, developed the technology in the US. They couldn't even be able to deploy some of its applications in the US because there were no regulations or policies around that. And so for when they came to Rwanda, we had a choice to decide, do we also sit and wait until someone has come up with a set of regulations that we are comfortable with to deploy these technologies? Or do we become bold enough and sort of figure out what could be those possible risks and how do we navigate them while being, the very f being at the forefront of testing and using these emerging technologies. And as you can imagine, we chose uh, the latter choice, which was we are going to test it. We have a big challenge of delivering medical products to health facilities. The investment of uh, putting in place cold room infrastructure facilities in every health facility is too high. 
that honestly, it only made sense that we can really be open to testing and trying uh, this use case application. And thanks to that boldness and, and the leadership of our president, we were able to be the very first country that put in place what we call performance-based regulations. And this has informed almost most of the regulations that every country is putting in place on how they can take full advantage and benefit from uh, drone technologies. But that wasn't, only, that wasn't the only um, benefit. The other benefit is because of that bold step to really test and try and be a proof of concept hub, we now have a thriving drone ecosystem with many local startups that are, uh, you know, some have already started building drones made in Rwanda. But what's interesting is how we're also using drones to spray uh, pesticide, to reduce the malaria spread, uh, to help with, uh, 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 with, uh, with uh, navigation. And so all of these are use cases that we've been able to unlock and opportunities, creating jobs, creating an industry that was non-existent uh, just by being, able, being open to test one use case, which was really delivering blood to health facilities. And just as I close on this point, I think what we continue to see is that, that the global competition is fueled by geotechnological revolution. And we're seeing this everywhere. And I think as a continent, I don't think we can afford uh, to do everything but be left behind in how we can be ready uh, to adapt and create uh, and, and be really and benefit from these uh, emerging technologies. The last segment I want to touch on is what the impact of emerging technologies on security, and I believe these are things that will resonate very much with most of you in the, in the audience. And this is from the ability to use emerging technologies to collect data in crime and um, conflict areas and enabling with early warning and response. But most importantly, I think we're starting to see the opportunity for artificial intelligence to transform the modern warfare with the, the advances we see in military technologies. And I think for all of us, the question then should be, how prepared are we? Because the benefits are there. We've seen successes in different parts of our continent. We've seen successes globally. Uh, but how prepared are we? And this really brings me to really the final bit of my intervention, which I hope the, last, the rest of the panelists can really build off on. Because even if we can see the impact, the benefits, the excitement, the risks, it boils down to do we have the foundational infrastructure in place? How well equipped with skills, basic digital literacy skills, but also the right skills, AI engineers, data scientists, you know, all these emerging technologies we're talking about, quantum computing, blockchain, do we have a skilled workforce that is going to be able to be at par with countries that are able to create and deploy some of these emerging technologies? And most importantly, I think a key question that we we'll all have to really answer and figure out how we join our efforts together is, all of this is not going to be possible if we're not, build, if we're not putting in place the necessary investments in research and development. If we don't do that, what will end up being is that we will only be consumers. And I don't think there are countries that have been uh, technologically advanced or economically advanced by simply being consumers. And the key question for us will always be around how much are we investing in research and development capabilities so that we're able to create and adapt these emerging technologies to our unique needs uh, that we have as a continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, for giving us uh, a broad overview and touching on the three aspects, uh, the economy, diplomacy, as well as uh, security. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, General Yossi to pick up from there. I think the minister ended on the security note. Uh, please share with us uh, what you understand by emerging digital technologies and uh, enlighten us uh, on the security aspect especially. Thank Over you to very General. much. Thank you very much, Patrick, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this interesting and important uh, symposium. It's uh, unlike uh, what I heard in the last couple of days where everybody started uh, saying that uh, he's speaking to the Rwandan uh, Defense Force and he has to explain why his presentation is connected to the uh, issues that, uh, that concern the Rwandan Defense Force. I'm speaking about security. It's very obvious why it is connected. Uh, I don't have to make explanations. And I want to take it from uh, where the minister left it. Because the minister said, are we prepared? And what do we need to do in order to be prepared? And I think that uh, this is extremely important because 
Uh, first of all, you're never prepared. It's, uh, it's, uh, as you said correctly, also in the realm of security, it's an ongoing learning competition. Uh, the, the limits are unknown, and we don't know how far we can go. We know that we advance all the time rapidly, but we never get to any point that is the last point uh, of the, this is the frontier. We always cross it. Uh, all kinds of technologies that we never realized that can be uh, materialized are already today known to everybody, and we believe that this is the way it was always been. I'll tell you a story. When I was the head of the research division in the Israeli intelligence uh, back in 2004, something like that, I was asked by the uh, uh, leaders of the, one of the big companies in Israel, Rafael, probably you heard about them, uh, to brief them on the security situation. So I gave them a briefing, and uh, they asked me in the, after the briefing, what is the most important threat that you think Rafael can do something about that would make a difference for Israel's security? At that time, the rockets we were facing from Gaza were three kilometers long, the range was three kilometers, and uh, they were uh, a small problem. But we knew that this is going to become a major problem within a very short period of time. And I told them, if you manage to come up with a solution to these long, short-range rockets that we in the intelligence tried to find out if the, we have the technology to do something about it and we didn't find any, then this is going to be highly appreciated. It's going to be a major contribution for the State of Israel. Mind you, a year earlier we found, we managed to foil an attempt by the Iranians to bring to Gaza long-range rockets. And we uh, uh, foiled this, uh, this attempt and uh, confiscated the weapons at sea. But this was produced in Gaza. So uh, I told them, if you manage to find a solution for that, this is going to be very appreciated, highly appreciated. So the uh, head of uh, Rafael asked uh, the head of the uh, technology in Rafael, do you think we can make it? He said, maybe, but it's going to be very costly and problematic. So we asked the chief of the finances of uh, Rafael, how much is it going to cost? He gave him a number, 900 million shekels, which is like uh, $500 million at the time. Uh, so the head of Rafael asked me, Cooper, that's my nickname in, in Israel. Cooper, can you speak with the Director General of the Ministry of uh, Defense and arrange for us 900 million uh, shekels for this purpose? He said, no problem. Tomorrow morning I'm going to speak with him. He said, so the guy from the uh, finances jumped up and said, can you ask 1.3 billion? <laughs> so <laughs> that's, uh, that's the problem with technology. It's very costly. It's, uh, are we prepared? It's not only a matter of whether we have the, ca te the capability from a technological point of view to find a solution. It's also about budgets, about priorities, about what you invest in your children, because it's all about education. If you don't invest in education properly, you're not going to have the people that are going to uh, deal with the technology uh, when, it, uh, when the time comes. It's, uh, all these things are interconnected. And uh, that's why you have to look at it from a strategic point of view, from a national point of view, and say to yourself, if you want to be prepared, you have to take the steps from very early age uh, in order to prepare your country to be uh, a, a power of technology. And uh, the importance of being a power of technology from a security point of view is critical because it's, first and foremost, it's, it affects the strategic power of, of the country. If you are able to handle technology right, if you are able to develop new te technologies, to handle the emerging technologies, as we call them, and the minister mentioned many of them, and the AI and so on and so forth. If you are able to do all of that, then your strategic stance is affected by that. Everybody appreciates Israel because it is a startup nation, because it has a lead on technologies in many respects. And uh, this is highly appreciated, and everybody here around the globe, and especially in the, our neighborhood in the Middle East, uh, knows that when we speak about 
a military or strategic qualitative edge, basically it is based on our ability to handle technology. And, uh, and technology is critical for uh, regular military confrontations. And it's critical for fighting terrorism. But it's also critical for fighting two new uh, kinds of uh, uh, campaigns that are uh, based on technology. Both the cognitive warfare today is dramatically based on uh, technology. And we see what's happening in, uh, in the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict uh, in, in this respect. And the cyber campaign, the cyber confrontation, is also based on technology. You can't do it without technology. And cyber is being used by everybody for, uh, for in the context of strategic confrontations. And uh, when you look at cyber as a tool of competition without running into kinetic warfare, it's one way of looking at, at it, but it's also a tool with which you can cause a lot of damage uh, to both sides, uh, and we see what's happening in the, around the world, around the globe in this respect, including in the Middle East, and uh, we have to be prepared to uh, use it properly uh, and uh, be able to protect ourselves against the attempts of the other side, and this is why cybersecurity is not only a matter of uh, uh, cyber, it's a matter of uh, security, it's, <laughs> it's called. And uh, this is a very critical part of our activities to defend ourselves because we are exposed to thousands of attacks of cyber, of cyber attacks every day. And uh, not only us, but we, amongst others, are exposed to these kind of attacks every day. So we are supposed to be able to fight the cyber, the cyber warfare. Of, on top of that, of course, uh, emerging technologies affect the kinetic warfare that we are familiar with. Uh, we have just uh, finished uh, another round of uh, violence with uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in, in Gaza, uh, in which we introduced for the first time uh, a new uh, capability uh, called the David Sling that is able to uh, deal and uh, intercept uh, medium-range uh, rockets and uh, missiles. Uh, we used it twice in this last uh, round of uh, violence. It uh, was very successful. This technology that enables us to, uh, just like Iron Dome, that enables us to uh, uh, intercept uh, incoming missiles, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a dream come true. And uh, in, in next year, we are going to uh, introduce a new uh, technology, laser technology, that's going to be able to uh, intercept uh, incoming uh, short-range rockets and mortar shells. Uh, which is something that we uh, need to, to deal with as well. Uh, so all these technologies are critical for uh, the old kinetic warfare that looks very different today than it used to look uh, in the past. Where I'm bringing the examples from our experience, but you can look at the Ukraine, the hi hypersonic uh, missiles. Uh, just uh, the, day, uh, the day before yesterday, the Russians launched uh, 30 uh, hypersonic missiles that uh, targets at uh, Ukraine. The Ukrainians claim that they have managed to intercept 29 out of them. That these are the, the kind of technologies we are looking at uh, at this point of time. It's, uh, it's the state of the art. And it's not only in the hands of the superpowers. The Iranians are there. It's, uh, they are developing all kinds of toys, uh, especially drones, but also uh, ballistic missiles and uh, cruise missiles. Uh, that are state-of-the-art uh, technology, and we have in this competition to be there before them and to uh, bring a solution that would intercept these missiles uh, just at, on time before they start launching them. It's, uh, it's very important. And the last area that I want to mention is, uh, is an area where the technology is a dramatic impact is the intelligence itself. Because intelligence stands behind all these uh, strategic uh, efforts and the military operational and uh, tactical efforts. Without intelligence, you can't do anything of that. Uh, the uh, intelligence has changed dramatically. First of all, because of the uh, big data situation, we are able today 
to do things that when I was a young officer in the intelligence, nobody dreamt of doing. For example, the ability to digitize all the information that we have and to uh, fuse it so that within a fraction of a second, you get, you get uh, information, fused information, that uh, enables you to say this is this and that is that. Uh, that this information that we, you got from uh, visual intelligence fits the information you got from uh, signal intelligence, fits the information you got from a human source, and, uh, and so on and so forth, and they all come together to give you a full picture of a situation that happens in a certain position, in a certain place, and enable you to, to say this is the target and this is not the target, and that's why you have to deal with this target and not with that one, and you can rely upon this information, this artificial inf information, you can rely on it uh, to the extent that you take decisions upon it. This is uh, something that is amazing. And uh, I can tell you, for example, that we have uh, shortened the time necessary to produce a target, and, uh, an ongoing target, and, uh, in the context of uh, confrontation, dramatically, and dramatically is not enough, is, no, is not a good enough description. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, this has already caused us to change an, entirely the way we look at, uh, uh, in, at intelligence. We, the, this ent old fashioned intelligence cycle is too, too slow for us. We need to, to be able to shorten it dramatically and so that's why we changed the organization of the intelligence. The entire organization should change in many areas, not only in intelligence, but also in intelligence. We changed the organization so that people sit together. We promote a jointness between all kinds of uh, elements that comprise the intelligence community uh, so that they will be able to produce the information we need on time. And time is, is of the essence in, when you speak about uh, security because uh, with the new development in the world, many things have uh, visibility that is very limited and for a very short period of time. You have to be able to, to reach them within this short period of time. And uh, of course, the entire issue of uh, visual intelligence has changed dramatically because of intelligence, because we are able to locate changes immediately. It's, uh, and we can cover a lot of ground and see all the changes immediately. It's something that, uh, that we, we cannot imagine how difficult it was to do that in the past. Uh, today, with these new intelligence uh, capabilities, we are somewhere totally different. So altogether, I'm not going to uh, deal in all the changes that happened in intelligence, but what we are looking at today has nothing to do with what was called intelligence in the past. It's, uh, it's a totally different animal, and uh, we have to realize that. And the last thing I want to say in this respect is that because of all of that, Intelligence has become not only a service that supports other efforts of the military and of the strategy, but also a battlefield of itself. It was the intelligence competition, uh, where uh, in most places, intelligence is responsible for cybersecurity, especially for critical facilities, and intelligence is responsible for fighting the cyber warfare uh, when necessary and preparing it for the time it is going to be necessary, and it's being done by the intelligence. So this is an area that the intelligence has turned from a support uh, element into the fighting element. And this is something that's also changed the, the, the state of mind of intelligence all over the world in, uh, in this time. All in all, this emerging technologies, uh, these emerging technologies have changed everything we know about security, about strategic security, about uh, military, sec military aspects, and about intelligence. And it requires, in order to be prepared, it requires a strategic approach and also a totally different approach about regarding international cooperation. It's, uh, that's also something that has to change because we have to help each other on those issues just the way we help each other on the old issues and find the new structures that would enable us with, in spite of the problems of trust and the uh, uh, security and the secrecy and the, all these issues, find ways to cooperate and share with our friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General, for giving us uh, such an in-depth uh, uh, dive into 
especially the security aspects of the topic we're discussing, uh, specifically sharing Israel, Israel's experience in uh, using emerging technologies to deal with uh, threats. As we all know, the Middle East is a very volatile and uh, they have adversaries to deal with. So it was useful to hear a uh, specific experience on that. I also want to pick out uh, a point he mentioned earlier about investing in education. Education, education, education. Starting at an early age to make sure that you have the right uh, skilled uh, manpower in a country. Um, I also took note of the point he mentioned that how a country handles emerging technologies has a direct impact on its strategic uh, standing. And of course, uh, what you shared about uh, the impact of emerging technologies on intelligence and how it has changed everything, uh, not only in security but also international affairs. You actually finished on the note on international affairs and I wanted uh, at this point to bring in uh, Sanju Narati, uh, Her Excellency the Cyber Diplomat. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to touch upon a very important uh, aspect, which is diplomacy today. Diplomacy is something which goes hand in hand with technology proliferation today. Today, around 60% of the population in Africa is under the age of 25 years of age. Um, everyone has uh, and is familiar with technology today. Everyone, uh, they are aspiring to get into tech jobs and uh, for more technology development in Africa. This particular aspiration, it needs to meet opportunities because otherwise it's going to breed uh, extremism, violence, and uh, even terrorism. Uh, how do we create these opportunities? And that's where international cooperation and diplomacy uh, is, plays a very key role. Today, in, for example, satellite technology in Africa, um, Today we have uh, South Africa uh, with, in collaboration with many international organizations. Uh, they are able to uh, utilize their talent, the, their human resources uh, for, for enabling more technology proliferation, spe specifically in satellite technology, uh, in cybersecurity, uh, in uh, blockchain uh, technology development, even in drones, the area of drones and counter drones uh, technology. Uh, so diplomacy and international uh, collaboration plays a very important role there. Um, I would also like to touch upon one important aspect which is on data governance. Today, I think uh, all nations across um, Africa have uh, data governance policies, uh, there are data regula leg regulatory authorities, uh, but there needs to be more symmetry in terms of um, the development or the regulation of data uh, that happens all across Africa, and also the way it is implemented. For example, today, if uh, there is a blockchain project being implemented, we know that it is, uh, the very core of it is uh, uh, having data governance uh, that has been taken into consideration and there are many compliances that are enforced by regulatory organizations. However, if there is no data integrity, uh, if there is no good data uh, that we get from the ground, then it becomes really, uh, it, it, the entire project fails because uh, we need integrity of data there. And um, that's where implementation uh, comes into account and international uh, collaborations and also certain international standards can play a very important role there in terms of uh, the implementation of data integrity standards. And uh, it will also help in diplomacy. Um, after, after this uh, data integrity and data regulation, we also need to look into the cross-border data aspects. Uh, for example, uh, today, uh, many West African countries, they have many privacy regulations 
uh, which uh, imposes the regulatory authorities to not share data uh, with other countries. Uh, this is leading to data havens, which is a huge security threat. And uh, this needs to also be taken into consideration uh, when we are talking about the diplomatic angles. Just like the tax havens, you have the data havens uh, that are now coming up. And um, without proper regulation and without diplomacy, and specifically cyber diplomacy, uh, it uh, becomes very uh, difficult for us to tackle these challenges. Uh, especially in data governance, in satellite technology, in uh, the implementation of uh, technology on the ground. I think uh, my co-panelists had mentioned all uh, the various uh, work that is happening and also uh, the importance of uh, security uh, in terms of um, uh, how technology is playing a role uh, in, uh, in intelligence gathering and um, uh, we need to look into the cyber angle of it. Uh, cyber angle is the other side of technology, really. Uh, it is, uh, when, when we talk about technology, technology is for the good of uh, you know, society. It is for the benefit of society. But when we talk about cyber, cyber looks into those aspects uh, which is mostly negative, which needs, needs to be dealt with. And uh, whether it is cyber crime, cyber attacks happening, cyber warfare, and uh, it needs to be looked into. And um, we need to strengthen international co collaborations, co cooperation, regulatory regime, and uh, also uh, the entire, uh, I would say, the standards uh, for technology proliferation, uh, especially from an African perspective. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> um, Sanjana, we appreciate uh, you sharing uh, insights uh, around uh, cyber diplomacy. Uh, I took note uh, of uh, the example you gave in South Africa where uh, they're trying to use uh, various enabling technologies, um, especially to empower and create opportunities for young people. Uh, issues around data governance and their symmetry around uh, data related issues. Uh, you talked about cross border data flows and the issue or that is emerging now of data heavens, just like uh, we know for, for many decades we've had specific uh, countries uh, which attract all the finances uh, into their countries. Uh, they become financial heavens. Now we're talking about data heavens. Uh, interesting uh, development there. And then you also talked about the need for international cooperation and uh, diplomacy in dealing with the security related issues. Um, I'd like to call on the, the last um, speaker uh, for this first part of our session today, Dr. Hamadoun Toure. As I mentioned uh, during the introduction, uh, Dr. Amadun Ture has experience that spans from government, international organizations, as well as the private sector. Uh, he's been in this industry for a very long time and uh, has seen the entire evolution of technology. And uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts, bring together what the various panelists have shared and uh, specific insights from you yeah. that you want to share with us today. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and I would like to First of all, uh, thank the organizers. This is my third time that I'm attending this uh, gathering. And uh, let me tell you, the quality is uh, very high. And having attended uh, many other international events, uh, I've, I would like to really say uh, thumbs up to the organizers. And uh, topics that, like this are discussed in many other areas. I'm a member of the World Federation of Scientists, where we are addressing the 17 emerging threats for the world. And uh, most of the issues that you are addressing here are part of that. Uh, and my task, uh, uh, as uh, Colonel Patrick has uh, asked me to do, was, would, would be to complement to what uh, the others have not, uh, uh, you know, mentioned probably, 
in order to avoid any unnecessary duplication uh, and bring it to the strategic level on what is happening in, the, in Africa, in, in the continent, so that together we would see how, on, on which direction we're going. You need to know here you are taking care of uh, the physical integrity of uh, the continent. Uh, and uh, when we are talking about security, there are many other types of securities. You have uh, uh, physical security, but you have virtual security as well. And we all know that uh, the next world war will start in the cyberspace, or could just happen there in the cyberspace. Let's hope that it just stay there. And people behind their computers will be fighting one another, and that's exactly what's happened. And we see today's wars are all, all starting in the cyberspace, because all the wars start with uh, uh, attacks of the command and control centers, and uh, we know that. Uh, the uh, safety is not only uh, physical now, the economic safety is a, a problem. And uh, addressing this in Africa is, uh, uh, it's important to highlight the fact that uh, uh, the most important threat for our generation is addressing the employment for the youth. If they are not feel safe in having employment, unfortunately we will continue to see the horrible scenes of uh, uh, people trying to cross the Mediterranean. And that's a shame for all of us. And those are the type of things that uh, we've been addressing to make sure that uh, we create an environment in the uh, ICT field uh, where we can create jobs here in Africa for our youth. In the world, when you look at it, two-thirds of the new jobs are created in the information and technology, in, in communication technology field. Two-thirds of the new jobs. And there are jobs that are that, that will be created uh, in now that never existed. We de there are new names for, the, for those jobs. And there are many jobs that will uh, simply disappear. So our challenge is how to make sure that we're going to make sure that we train our people to be uh, uh, using those uh, technologies to create new jobs for themselves and also uh, use uh, the, the technology as well to be more productive. Uh, I must say one of the weaknesses uh, in Africa in use of technology is that we use more technology for uh, uh, internet for social media. It's like using electricity for light only. If you're not using electricity for productivity to increase, to create uh, uh, things and jobs uh, then, and uh, make wealth uh, then it's, it's, it's useless. And uh, using uh, internet just for uh, communicating, for vi uh, video streaming and uh, uh, messages uh, is not uh, really very productive. So we need to find ways to make sure that we are more productive. In Africa, we have seen this yesterday, 1.4 billion people is 1.4 billion consumers and 1.4 billion users. We can create wealth in the continent with this, those 1.4 billion consumers. I mean, any businessman, when you tell him that you have 1.4 billion uh, consumers, if he can make a dollar a day from each of them, he's a multi-billionaire. And here are the opportunities for Africa. When you are talking about this uh, uh, economy, you have infrastructure. The, the challenges and the needs of infrastructure are tremendous, from fiber, net, uh, fiber networks, data centers, uh, switching networks, uh, switching systems, um, I mean, uh, terminal equipment. All of those are necessary. That's only one pillar, the infrastructure. The second big pillar is the content. There is tremendous content in Africa here that can make many people busy 
creating new opportunities, new jobs for themselves, just gathering content, uh, creating, organizing it, be it for health or for uh, 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 historical issues, cultural, uh, I mean, any if you mean government, education, all of those are necessary. And the third key pillar of this is uh, the applications and services. There are opportunities for so many applications and services. Imagine uh, African youth creating apps that you use on your smartphones. If every, every week we could have a young person creating an app that could be bought by 10% of the population, he will be a millionaire. You can create that every week. And those applications are local solutions to local problems. I'm sure you have more, uh, more than 100 uh, applications on your uh, smartphone today. A and I'm sure you're using probably 10% of them because they were not made by you, unfortunately, or not made for, for uh, and, and no, they were not even made for you. They were made for somebody else, for his need. And you are, it fits some of your needs, may, maybe not, not necessarily all of it. And therefore, uh, if we bring our youth to create applications, they will make applications that be mostly fitting our ordinary needs here in Africa. And therefore, if we buy it from them, just a dollar each, they will get, create millionaires in the continent. And there is a need for that. And that, those are exactly some of the things that we're doing. Uh, I will also add the last point on that is the, the last pillar is education, capacity building. We need to be trained. Our youth are not trained in uh, uh, many uh, issues uh, that are for the future. And, and therefore, we need to, to train them so that they'll be ready to fight in the uh, global war, global uh, scene. Uh, General Josie mentioned it. Uh, he, he used the key word. He said uh, we, there is an ongoing competition. In Africa, we are naive. We think, we, we believe in friendship, and there's no such thing in international uh, play in the international arena. We, we, we naively don't know that there is a competition going on in everything. We compete. We can f have a friendly competition, but it's still a competition, and we need to be aware of that. And, and therefore, we, in, when we are working with uh, other players, we need to be sure that, uh, uh, unfortunately, the pandemic, uh, the, 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 the COVID pandemic has, has shown the, uh, the, the, the truth. Uh, some countries were gathering three doses of, uh, of, of vaccine. While we needed one dose, we didn't have it on time. That's the world we are in. The Ukraine war, unfortunately, has also shown us uh, how many friends we have. Yesterday on the session was uh, on, on, on the peacekeeping issues. I mean, how much money was needed uh, for the Sahel region? For a year, 1.4 billion. It was gathered in a week in, in Ukraine. There's a difference. We have to be aware of it, unfortunately. But what, how, what were, are we doing to address that? What have, have we done when we created together here under the leadership of uh, President Kagame, the Smart Africa Initiative, is to make sure that we bring our countries together because we can say we are 1.4 billion consumers, but in, rea in reality, we are 54 small countries, small countries and 54 small markets. And at that level, at that scale, you are meaningless. You only make value if you come together. And strategically, that's what we've been trying to do, bring Africa together in a way that all Africans will play together 
and do the thing together and be one market and have economies of scale. If we are doing cybersecurity in one country, the same servers, the same routers, the same uh, 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 applications can be used for other countries instead of each of us having its own. If we have a data center that is uh, giving, gathering information for education or health, the same could be used for others, same power. And, and especially when we are going in quantum compu computing now, the, where the advances are so fast, the, the calculation computing, the computing power is so fast that it, it's even threatening for those who are working on it today. Why we, are, we have many research and developments are being slowed down in quantum computing because you, you realize this tool, the power of this tool, if it's in the hand of a wrongdoer, of a criminal, how much damage he can do. I mean, if, if think that uh, uh, to unlock password on a computer that would take probably a month for huge computers today, in counter computing it will be in less than two seconds. And therefore a criminal can be very dangerous those are some of the reasons why some of the things are being slowed down. You've seen all the uh, uh, discussions about uh, artificial intelligence in that, and the, the, the dangers of it today and some of the things that uh, it might bring. But of course, technology, you can't stop technology advances and we shouldn't stop it actually uh, because you always, uh, uh, will find ways and means to block the, the, the wrongdoers, as they used to say. If you, it's not because somebody will be stealing uh, candies in the supermarket that you're gonna lock down the, the supermarket itself. No, you, you, you take measures to avoid that, but that's how you move forward. So when we are doing uh, initiatives like uh, the Smart Africa initiative in order to bring all African continent together, we assure that every country will have a line of action to take into account, in his, to, to, to undertake in his, in his own country and bring it uh, collectively to the others. One will deal with smart cities, another one with, uh, 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 you name it, any type of technology, you know, and uh, we, you experiment it at home and you bring it to others so that they, we go fast together. Those are some of the initiatives and the way in Africa. And I think it's important to note that this initiative is going very well. It was created here in 2013. Uh, in 2015, it became operational under the, the leadership of President Kagame and seven, seven, six other heads of states. There were seven heads of states in Africa who started this together and it's grew now, we have, we have about 39 countries that are in it, that are going together, it's growing fast. Uh, and when, you, yesterday we, we talked about uh, the uh, free zone, the economic free zone. I believe that the digital economy will be the first actually service that will take off in this free zone area, even though the uh, aviation has been selected uh, to have uh, the open skies for Africa, aviation will be the first uh, service to be implemented, but uh, that, that has been selected, but re in reality, the digital integration will be faster. Just like when the WTO was created, the World Trade Organization was created, the services in telecommunication were first to come in because it's fast and it, it doesn't require too much uh, financing uh, and it's uh, profit making and therefore whenever you have a good project you will have funding for it because it make, you can make profit, you can make money out of it and private sector is leading it and uh, in our jargon we say there's nothing wrong with making money as long as you are creating jobs, you are moving forward. And that's how we are 
bringing, uh, individually we are doing this, but collectively we have uh, uh, our interest. None of the uh, devices we are using here today have been made in Africa. That's another challenge we are facing. Are we going to industrialize the continent? When you have 1.4 billion consumers, I mean, there is a real uh, business case for manufacturing for those. And therefore, there are strategies to, to work with uh, other partners to bring in manufacturing here in a win-win mode. Everybody should, should win while we are making sure that uh, the services and, application, uh, services and applications that we are putting together are also useful for a, all, all of us together. Any application made here in Rwanda will have its use in, uh, in neighboring Kenya or in South Africa or in Mali. So we, uh, when we do that uh, uh, individually and collectively, uh, we might also solve one of the weaknesses we have here. If something is made in, in Rwanda, another neighboring country may be saying, oh, this is just in Rwanda. I will not, it may not be good. They would prefer to buy something coming from another continent, unfortunately. But if we collectively create the interdependence where you're making, I'm buying from you, you are buying from me, then therefore there will be a real good trading inside the system, the, the, the continent, and that will create uh, really some good effects. One of the weaknesses in our economy is the fact that when you inject $100 million, the million dollar is being paid back outside directly. In other cultures, I'll say in Israel, that, was, that million dollar will change hands seven times in the community before it gets out of the community. So each hand it will be a millionaire in the process. So you have seven millionaires. In our case, a million comes in and goes out. Only one millionaire has been created in the process. So it's very short, very slow. So the effect of creating the interdependence will solve that problem of having to, to change uh, the, the hands for the, our, our money will move inside. If we're $100 million that have changed seven times, we have had so, some people who had seven, $700 million is actually activity that happened. And, and therefore, uh, we have to bring in strategies to put that together and that's what we are trying to do. And again, those initiatives will create jobs, hundreds of millions of jobs uh, that could be created in the information and communication technology field. And the ongoing strategies, I believe, are fitting really the international uh, 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 movement, and, and therefore uh, Africa can be a winner in the process. I will stop here. A round of applause for Dr. Amadun Toure for sharing uh, a lot of insights, uh, the role of cyber in modern warfare, job creation. Uh, he emphasized the need to use emerging technologies for productive activities as opposed to just entertainment and uh, communication. Emphasized the importance of education. Uh, and of course, uh, talked about uh, a single digital market for Africa and unifying Africa and delivering technology towards that. There's a point he mentioned about the computing power that is available uh, today. It reminded me that uh, everyone over here in this room, I would assume that carries a smartphone. And today the amount of computing power you have in your smartphone, uh, I also have one of those here, is more power than NASA had when they sent a man to the moon, when they were sending those rockets to the moon. You can imagine how much power you have in your pockets 
if you're able to convert that into uh, productive power for productive purposes. I'd like now to bring in the audience. We have uh, maybe another 45 minutes. Uh, I wanted to open this up to the audience um, so that you have been uh, eavesdropping on a conversation between the panelists. It's time now to hear from you. Um, and we engage on this topic. Um, let's start from the back. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I am Professor Isaac Alali Albert. I'm from University of Ibada in Nigeria. Uh, I want to thank the panelists because uh, they have expanded our frontiers of knowledge on digital technologies. I'm a professor of security studies and I've been studying the role of dig digital technologies in security for the past uh, five years. And as the panelists have told us, there is no end to what digital technologies could do. So we have to keep investing in it. And it has to do with R&D, research and development. And the more you throw into research activities in digital technologies, the more you get. I was recently invited to give a keynote address to an academy of uh, humanities. And in the process of my reading outside my focus of security, I realized that humanities in the developed world is expanding very fast to the extent that we have what is now called digital humanities. Indeed, you cannot even, you cannot in understand the history of your country without going digital now. So we have digital history, we have digital, you know, so we need to invest more on digital technologies. Uh, for those of us from different parts of Africa, my interest is in Africa, I think we have to go back to begin to ask ourselves, how can we reinforce or invent Africa, reinvent the development of Africa by investing more in digital technologies. Um, when we Professor. Okay. You can. Thank you. Let me stop here. Oh, I was, okay. I thought I you was could actually, 30 seconds to wind up. Yes. <laughs> I was actually trying to uh, call attention to my research on Boko Haram terrorists in Nigeria and then the Islamic states of Greater Sahara across West Africa. They are now investing heavily on drones. And I've been asking the questions around, how many of these drones are those of us who are fighting terrorism in that region know that these people are using? Because counter-terrorism is not just a matter of charging through military obstacles and trying to defeat the enemy. You need to understand the technology that the enemy is actually deploring. The only thing I hear is that they are using drones. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, what kind of drones are the terrorists in those areas using? Thank you. Uh, I think to be efficient, we'll take maybe three or four at the same time and then get uh, comments from the panel. Let's go in the middle. Yes, pass on the microphone. Uh, so, um, Lieutenant Colonel Innocent Gisagara from Rwanda Defense Force and student. So my question is, how is emerging digital technologies in Africa has improved yields per hectare, say from 10 to 20 tons, both food and cash crops, and this one, how much has led to food security 
and exports uh, to our revenues. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, right next to, yes, and then we'll go to the other side. Thank you, moderator. My name is uh, Rutembe Sadidi. I'm from the Immigration Department. <clears throat> Uh, and my question will be addressed to Dr. Amadoun. We have about only 25% of the African population having access to, to internet. And I'm wondering, don't you think that we should be having a discussion on, uh, on expanding access to digital technology rather than uh, discussing the impact of the emerging di the digital technology? So the issue I think for me should be how do we expand access to digital technology rather than discussing now uh, the impact of the emerging uh, di uh, digital technology. Thank you. Okay, let's take next, yes. And then we'll come in front. Thank you. I'm Major Erika Severa from Lugua Defense Force and I'm a student. My question is addressed to General Kupawasir. So in the digital domain, uh, on the cyber domain, security threats have no borders. A cyber attack which can originate from Europe can go through Africa to attack elsewhere, which means it requires a collective approach to fight such threats. Also, as you rightly said, to achieve this security, it requires a large budget. But what I see as the biggest challenge is not even the budget because the, the states can make it a priority. But it's the knowledge, the knowledge required. If we have that budget without the knowledge, you cannot achieve that security. So my question is, since uh, Israel is already advanced in both knowledge and technology, how does Israel collaborate with the other countries, especially in Africa, to make sure that the engineering capacity is achieved so that that collective security at the end is achieved. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I think we can uh, take those. So let's come to the panel. I think the, uh, the, the first question uh, from the professor uh, was talking about um, the need for R&D continuous. Uh, we're talking about digital history. It's the first time I heard about that one, but um, he was also talking about the use of drones to fight terrorism. Uh, maybe the general can make a comment on that. Yes, well, so first of all, I will uh, connect the first question and the last question. Yes, by the way, you connect questions so that we efficiently respond to these. Okay, because uh, this both uh, addressed uh, the point that uh, the technology has no no borders and uh, can be used also by our adversaries, not also not only by us. Yes. And uh, I fully agree with the professor saying that uh, we need to know in detail what are the exact capacities and the capabilities of those drones, and what uh, can be done in order to uh, uh, diminish those cap uh, capabilities. That's, uh, that's something that uh, is based in, that's what intelligence is for. And uh, I hope uh, those in Nigeria that uh, fight it uh, have, the, have, have the necessary knowledge uh, in order to fight them uh, effectively. Uh, drones, as we can see all around the world, can be intercepted and uh, if you know what drone you are fighting against you are going to be more capable of intercepting it. All of that is true uh, also in this context of the last question and uh, yes in order to, to know that in the, in the first question cooperation with other places that uh, may use similar drones is, uh, is necessary in order to be more effective and uh, I think that uh, we in Israel understand this, uh, this uh, situation. By the way, we have uh, uh, been attacked, cyber attacked, by groups that uh, call themselves Sudan Army, and uh, they are not, but uh, they use this term, uh, and the group that are the Malaysian Army, 
Uh, we have all kinds of people from all over the world are trying to attack us. Uh, some of them are really coming from those places. Some of them are just uh, using this term, uh, these uh, names. Uh, we fully understand that, uh, as I said, international cooperation is critical. And I said, uh, international cooperation is, is uh, both for the sake of supporting other friends, and also, it's a, a, we are also selfish, because we understand that this is a war against all of us. And uh, if uh, one of us suffers, all of us suffer. So uh, we understand that there is a need to cooperate. That said, what I mentioned in the beginning, and still uh, is valid, and uh, I think Dr. Tu alluded to that as well, is that uh, this cooperation is being performed in a very cautious manner. Because the knowledge that you have developed is a state secret, is a, is a value in your strategic standing. It's something that you have to, to know how to share it properly. And uh, the, uh, we have to be very cautious. You know, uh, for example, not talking necessarily about Africa, uh, We've been asked many times to uh, share all kinds of technologies with the Ukrainians. And uh, we are cautious about that because we say to ourselves, okay, we share this technology and tomorrow it falls into the hands of the Russians and we may end up in Iran. So uh, we have to be uh, uh, very prudent in, in, in the way we share uh, very sensitive information and technologies that we have developed. What we can do, and we are more willing to do, uh, is to share with those friends of ours, including in Africa, the, the way to develop this knowledge themselves. This is, uh, this is a much easier way of cooperation. It's not on the expense of uh, sharing uh, information and uh, technologies, but it's uh, even more important for everybody with, with whom we cooperate. We share the ways we have used in order to develop and come to the conclusions that we have uh, reached. And if you are able to uh, do that by yourself, then this is the, the best way uh, to do it. Of course, as was mentioned before, this takes infrastructure, technological infrastructure, this takes uh, education, this takes all these uh, other things that we were talking about before. And, uh, but if we in, in invest in those, then the cooperation is going to be much more fruitful uh, in the future. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Patrick. I think I wanted to come back to perhaps three of the questions that have been asked. The first one that was asked by uh, Professor Isaac on the research and development uh, investments that we have as a continent. And I had a few statistics that I wanted to share. Um, and this is really coming from a World Bank study that was done in 2017, which means really these statistics are probably now, when we do the next study, we should see a difference. But basically, in terms of research and development, what we could see, uh, for example, for the United States of America, they had a GDP of $19 trillion uh, um, uh, with a subsequent investment of R&D that was close to $0.5 million. Then you had China, the second largest, that had about 0.25 trillion million dollars invested in research and development. On the other hand, when you look at Africa collectively, what you see is with a GDP of $2 trillion, we have a subsequent investment of $0.02 trillion in research and development, which is really much lower than most of the economies. And I think that brings us perhaps to most of the questions that are being asked on the panel and the questions that you're asking yourself, Professor Isaac. How do we col collectively put together the right investments in research and development? How do we become intentional about which areas of digital technologies and emerging te technologies where we want to collectively invest? And I think Dr. Turi said it very well. It's not a question of one country has done something let the other 53 countries also copy and do something similar because the emerging technologies are extensive. And so the ability to be able to invest in pieces of each of those aspects and being able to collectively bring this together, I think, will create uh, value for all of us. Now, the other question I wanted to come back to is the one that um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Innocent raised, which was around 
um, if there were statistics around yields per hectare exports, I think while measurement largely is still uh, problematic in terms of tangibly having proper statistics on how much yield per hectare has been improved, I think what we are seeing is the ability for emerging technologies to address the different barriers that most of the farmers in Africa and largely who are smallholder farmers are facing, which is access to capital, access to uh, you know, resources such as seeds and, and, um, and fertilizers, and then also access to market, which is critical. I think one of the things we're also seeing is most of the farmers are able to produce, but then I'll, 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 from, from crop to table, in between there, a lot is spoiled because they don't have the right storage facilities and, and really the efforts now that are being put in place is what uh, technologies can be put in place that allow for this aggregated um, use across the different farmers uh, in different communities. I'll give you an example of um, an innovation it's called Hello Tractor that is happening on the continent where it's really trying to address the uh, barrier around access and affordability. Uh, what you see is on the continent we have about 13 tractors for every 100,000 square kilometers of land. This is very low compared to what, you, what you, to what you see in other parts of the world where you have at least 200 tractors for the same number of 100,000 um, uh, square kilometers of land. So what has be happened is that this innovation tries to bridge that gap where not every smallholder farmer is going to afford to have a tractor on their own, which of course contributes to increased yield. And so what they're doing is how do we put in place renting and leasing options that make it possible for those that cannot afford to buy uh, to then lease and rent it at very affordable rates and then uh, you know, uh, benefit from the increased uh, productivity that comes with using uh, such tractors. Uh, the food industry in Africa is projected to reach about one trillion US dollars by 2030, and that is going to be thanks to uh, you know improved access to to seeds and fertilizers. What we continue to see when we do actual measurements is that for every 10 percent internet penetration on the continent, you have a, contri a commensurate contribution of 1.25 percent GDP growth. And so, when we talk about internet penetration, you're really touching every aspect from access to healthcare, access, uh, you know, improved agricultural productivity, improved education outcomes, which ultimately comes down to this 1.35% uh, GDP growth. Um, and, and then finally, I know, Dr. Ture, this was coming to you, but I didn't want to miss the chance to, to touch on it. I think Rutembesa asked the question around access. Should we even be talking about impact and not access? I think we don't have the luxury to talk about one and leave out the other. Um, and I think in some of the conversations we're having on this panel, we're not ignoring the fact that some of the foundations have to be in place. General Yossi talked about education. Uh, we've talked about uh, the need for the right regulations. Uh, we've talked about funding being a key constraint to actually being able uh, to really benefit fully into this. But I think for Africa, it's less of an access problem now. It's more a usage problem. The statistics we're seeing, and I think earlier in my interventions, I talked about COVID-19 having, having we, we, the, the digital ecosystem. We had so many silver linings with the COVID-19 pandemic because we were able to see accelerated investments in digital infrastructure. What you see is that at least more than 70% of Africans are living within areas of coverage, but less than 20% can actually access it. So now the question for us as policymakers on the continent and also different players is not just access because access is you can deploy money and have fiber connectivity and it's there, but how many people that are living in those areas that are covered with that access are actually benefiting? And so that brings us to the bigger challenge which we are now trying to solve for and which has been spoken to, uh, uh, you know, uh, about on this panel. For, use, for the usage gap to be closed, you need the right digital skills, you need affordable devices, the cost of internet needs to be affordable for people. You also have to have the right content. I think Dr. Terry talked about content because if most of our Africans are going to go on the internet and they have content that is in languages that they don't understand, then the, 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 they will not be able to use it in a meaningful way. And so those four challenges are what we're trying to solve for to ensure that much as access has been addressed largely, 
the usage gap can also be closed. And where the impact conversation becomes helpful is that it creates that value proposition to why we need to mobilize the right resources, our efforts in ensuring that everyone that is living in areas that are covered is able to access in a meaningful way, but at the same time we can continue to cover the gaps that we uh, still largely have in, in different parts of the continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, Dr. Hamadoun Toure, I recall that in 2007, by the way, which was the year that we got the first uh, smartphone as well as the first Android uh, smartphone uh, became available. Uh, that same year you co-hosted the Connect Africa Summit together with His Excellency President Paul Kagame. Share something about uh, access in Africa. Yeah, I will do that. Thank you very much. But before I will just start to say a few words about uh, the question on intelligence. I think uh, uh, the capabilities that our countries have is being underestimated, which is which is fine. When when you are underestimated, uh, you know you can perform. You you will always perform better than expected. So which is fine. And there are a lot of things going on. I will not uh, go into details into which countries they are advanced uh, because it's confidential. It's better, and I have the effect of surprise is necessary whenever in, uh, it comes. Uh, but our countries are indeed cooperating with uh, other countries, and what we need to do more is to use our own people to improve on whatever we have here. We have young engineers uh, who are good in computer, com in computer science who can add a lot of value in those things, and we should not go outside to look for it. They're the ones who can uh, make things for us, and they are very innovative. I, I, I'm very much confident in them. You know, I, I mean, I'm an Afro-optimist because uh, I, I, I believe in that. Uh, uh, it's the same thing when we are talking about poverty in Africa. I mean, w they are telling us that we are poor. With all the wealth we are sitting on, w to the point that we believe in it. We believe that we are poor. We go back and say, oh, we are a poor and debted country. Please help us. We're looking for help. The most developed country in the world today is, is discussing this week that debt, $74 trillion. It was uh, t t two days ago. I'm sure it may have reached 75 or 76 trillion now. That's what you're talking about. So everything is a matter of perception. Yeah, and we, uh, whether we believe in ourselves and we, we know what we're gonna do, and I think that uh, there is a lot that we can do. The same thing is in, uh, in, the, in the area of uh, uh, internet penetration. As uh, Patrick said, we started some strategies long ago when we initiated this, uh, the Connect Africa Summit in 2007. All the other regions in the world has, uh, have asked us to do the same thing in their regions because it came out with very strong resolutions and strategies that helped uh, the continent to move forward. Uh, remember at the time, the telephone penetration was at 5%. I had an interview on CNN at that time, and the gentleman was telling me there's more telephones uh, in the city of New York than the whole continent of Africa. And I said, but that means that we have more opportunities than New York. We have, I have 95% opportunity for growth. And here we are, uh, 15 years later, there are more telephones in Africa than the whole United States. So that, that things are happening. And the issue of uh, uh, access in rural areas has been addressed. We, we, uh, that's why we created, back in the year 2000, the, what we call the Universal Service Fund. Universal Service Fund is a, a fund that, that was taking, taken from the operators, one, one or two percent, depending on the countries, to take one or two percent on their, on their, on their revenues and use that for access in the rural areas. When you're talking about uh, internet penetration, 35%, uh, it's even lower for broadband penetration because we're no longer talking about internet. It has to be, to be broadband to, for internet to be uh, meaningful. As I was saying, if internet is used for just sending messages, of course, it has an impact because you send a message instead of traveling, you're saving costs, you're saving time, you're saving energy, but 
uh, if you use it for uh, a productive thing like uh, e-agriculture, e-health, e-education, those are the most important things and it will have a real production, a real effect on the productivity and those are going on. When you are looking at, uh, when you are uh, evaluating your network, there are four elements you're looking at. One is coverage. Are you covered, is the whole country covered? If not, we have to address that. Uh, second is uh, uh, the cost, affordability. Is the thing is affordable and how much percent of the cost of the, uh, the you're paying for communication from your revenue? in the highly developed countries, uh, three to five percent of your revenue is used for communicating. But in uh, some of the developing countries, it can be up to 50 percent of your revenue used for communication. That is very important. Uh, the third one is uh, the uh, service quality. Service quality and diversity of the services. Uh, and it, that's very important because uh, the service quality can make or break, you know, uh, the, the, the service itself. And, and therefore, it is very important to ensure that the operators are coming with the right uh, service quality that is the same service quality that are giving uh, to uh, the cities is given in the rural areas or the same service they're giving to their customers they provide to their competition as well because competition may use your system as well and therefore you didn't, shouldn't discriminate them. Uh, and the last thing is usage, as uh, Patrick mentioned. Usage is important, and usage uh, of the service will depend on the knowledge about the service itself. That's, that's why an, a well-educated uh, consumer is a better consumer. Then, therefore, you have to train them on those services and applications that they will be using as well in the process. Uh, all these things are being taken into account in Africa here, and we are moving, and many countries are doing their level best to make, make sure that uh, it's taken into account. There are regulatory authorities uh, like RURA, and Patrick was uh, head of uh, RURA here for uh, over seven years, and uh, they are the ones, the referees on the field, who are looking, monitoring, and they can decide when, whenever uh, prices are too high, how to deal with it. If price is too high, maybe the competition is not strong enough. If coverage is not there, the, the, uh, the serv universal service fund may be used for infrastructure that will be used by all the operators at the same time and they'll continue to compete on it and give the same uh, uh, price that they're giving to the cities where there is more higher usage and price can go, can go lower. And therefore, uh, all those things are, are, are happening, and you have the, the ecosystem is, completely, is, is complete with the regulatory authorities and the ministries making the laws, going to the parliament, defending them, and giving it back to the regulators who are the referees, who are applying those rules on the field. Uh, you need to bring in the ecosystem everybody, uh, the professionals of... Uh, uh, the computer, computing science, uh, or uh, or uh, of telecommunications, of internet, the professionals on, in the user side, in the content development side, all of them need to come together so that it really be meaningful. Uh, E-government is one of the key areas, and in that, you, you uh, our countries are really learning from one another and moving very fast. There are many initiatives that are being taken at the level of the African Union today for uh, uh, digital uh, uh, identities, uh, for uh, e-government that are sharing our common good practices and even our uh, lessons learned or uh, uh, bad examples that have that would, that would, bad experiences. It, it will be important to share them because it will be a shame if someone has to make a mistake that was made by your, your neighbor uh, and it's a waste of time or reinvent something that was already invented by somebody else. That's, that's why we're trying to go fast and go together. So all those initiatives are going on. And I can assure you that uh, uh, the uh, path that I see in the continent uh, enables us to positively say that uh, we're on the right path. We need to see 
some of the results in terms of job creation. We need to see some of the uh, results in uh, on uh, services and application in more transparency, financial services. You see, some of the things that uh, you see in the world today have been that have been invented in Africa. Somebody mentioned um, Pesa yesterday, mobile payment. It was inv invented in Africa by Africans because it was a local solution to local problems that they have. People who don't have an account, bank account, who, who want to transfer little amounts of money, who, who do not exist in the economic system at all, as the World, world Bank will define them. They created this, and thanks to that, you can pay a hamburger or pay your parking in New York or, 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 or Tokyo, thanks to that. So there are things that we can invent here in Africa and then export them, and things we will learn from others. I think this, the world has become a global village, and we all have to take good advantage of it and have very real confidence in our citizens and give them the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take a second round of questions, but I'm also going to change the rules a bit. Uh, please keep your question uh, maximum to one minute, 30 seconds if possible. And also the panel, let's keep it to two minutes or less so that we try to end the session on time. Let's take another round of questions. Okay. Let's again start here, uh, right here in the middle. Thank you very much, panel, for another hugely informative and inspiring session. Um, my question, of course, is um, very complex, but uh, in just a couple of minutes, I just wanted to ask whether um, Africa could take its leadership in thought um, to leapfrog the challenges of technology. We've heard uh, that um, uh, in, in the field of intelligence, for example, um, there are enormous potential, and of course we shouldn't shirk from using that capability to uh, kill, if necessary, those who want to kill innocents. Um, but when we get the, um, this information available to us in a very um, a graphical fashion fused uh, with human intelligence, with, um, with uh, a technical intelligence and visual intelligence, it gives us the impression of um, accuracy, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. As practice has shown, it can actually multiply exponentially the errors involved. And the cost of getting things wrong, as we discovered when we used similar technology in Afghanistan, was um, only about $150 for a young child being killed. That's what we paid the father. And if his wife was killed, um, then we paid him $300. It's not uh, a, a very uh, suitable solution for Africa. So should we now look at the um, humanities aspects of uh, fusing technology, uh, certainly for Africa, where the cost of life and I'm not talking necessarily in terms of ethical reasons, but where in Africa we have developed, I believe, according to our discussion on the first day, a much more sophisticated approach to security which ties itself with sustainable ideas of justice and value of and respect for human life. Should we not look at investment in research and development, uh, Honorable Minister, in how that technology is used, and using um, very good uh, ideas such as thinking fast, thinking slow, using that analogy to apply it to information. Thank you, sir. Uh, in the middle there again. Yes, the microphone, the person next to you. Thank you very much. I'm Superintendent Emmanuel Yako, a student. My question will be directed to the minister. Uh, as we are embracing uh, the technologies in Africa, developing countries who are inclusive is continually becoming a victim of the racing technology, among of which revolves on uh, penetrating our systems as well as absolute systems. So far, the legal framework in Rwanda 
is mainly focusing on the punitive aspect. It does not provide the latitude for the IT adventurists to test the security features of our applications, all our systems, on good will. My question is, does the ministry you lead has any intentions of establishing an independent laboratory for adventuring IT specialists, at least to exercise and test our systems before they are being penetrated or hacked by other malicious penetrators. Thank you. Uh, let's have a question next, yes. Next person there. Sir, I'm Major Sande Felicia from Rwanda Defense Force. I'm a student. The question uh, read, what are the potential implications of space debris and the increasing militarization of space on space security and uh, what measures are being taken to mitigate these risks and ensure long-term sustainability of space activities? Thank you. Let's take, uh, yes, right in front, sir. The microphone in front. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I take this. I'm Brigadier General Dr. Emmanuel Shirinji. I'm the Defense Advisor Rwanda from Uganda. Uh, first of all, I take this opportunity to thank the panelists for giving us a, a great insight about the digital technologies. Uh, uh, I take note of the broad impacts of uh, digital technologies uh, that, as the Brigadier General from Israel said, are uh, undergoing a continuous and ongoing competition and are able to be used positively or negatively. But I want to zero at the positive aspect of it. And here I will go to the area of early warning. And further zero on, especially on weather and security. Whereby on weather we are constantly being overrun and surprised by the vagaries of nature, floods, earthquakes. And on security, of course, I'm looking at the issue of uh, enemy detection and yeah, performance, uh, proper for good performance in the operational theater. So uh, when I look at uh, that, I really wonder with the coverage we have the issue becomes really strategic that we need to invest this, uh, take it a bigger step so that uh, the digital technology is employed to enable us uh, overcome these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's take one last one and then we'll right in the middle there. Yes. And then we'll have the panel respond. Thank you, sir. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Simplis Mlenzi, a student. So, uh, we understand that uh, uh, digital technology is important uh, in various ways, uh, particularly diplomacy, uh, economy, and security, as earlier mentioned. However, uh, it's quite expensive, as uh, you rightly said, in terms of investing and also developing the knowledge. Uh, in the gadgets, manufacturing the gadgets, and uh, uh, establishing internet connections around Africa. However, when you look at the purchasing power of an ordinary African, you find it uh, quite still low. 
and this affects uh, the, 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 the outcome or the, the, the result of being beneficial to many other than few who are able. Now, my concern is what are the strategies uh, to make sure that the, the, the purchasing power of an ordinary citizen in Africa is actually increased so that he can be able uh, to access the internet at low cost and also the gadgets that can enable him or her to, to benefit to all these uh, digital technologies we are mentioning about, especially in terms of security. Thank you. Thank you. I'll not be taking another round of questions. If there is one final burning, yes, sir, we'll take that and we'll uh, end it there. Here in front. Uh, thank you, moderator. My name is Honorable Minister Lieutenant General Nakibus Lakara from Uganda. I just want to learn from you, Honorable Minister Ngabire. You adopted drone technology. This was something that was new, unknown. And therefore, there were a lot of uncertainties. Uh, of course, during the planning, there must have been several considerations, including possible adverse effects should this system go wrong. And so, you must have taken into account what would be done. So, but would love to share those contingencies were there any contingencies vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis what could go wrong? Any lessons that we can learn from there? And you being a minister, and of course a member of uh, the Council of Ministers of the East African Affairs, having gone through this phase and these success stories, have you shared this successful Rwanda experience such that the rest of the region can adopt this? A success. I thank you, Honorable Minister Isamit. Thank you, sir. Let's come to the panel now. Uh, I'd like to ask that we respond to any of these questions, but also make any other comment that we'd like to make. And uh, I'll start with uh, our cyber diplomat. Any comments you want to make at all? Um, and uh, then we we'll, like Yes. Regarding the drones um, um, security aspect uh, with regards to Africa, uh, it's, uh, it's important for us to consider that uh, for drone proliferation, uh, satellite technology is something which is very important. Uh, the GIS systems and how it works. Today, most of the drones that are being used uh, are mostly commercial drones and uh, they are not subjected to export import of uh, uh, regulations but technology is something uh, it needs to be looked into uh, more deeply uh, from the export uh, import or dual use uh, usage uh, uh, regulatory point of view for us to even control or um, find out a counter terrorist mechanism for drone technology the other issue is also with regards to e-waste. Uh, today, a lot of e-waste uh, is being dumped out of uh, West Africa, and it is being used by non-state actors to make technologies from the e-waste, because after all, the mobile phones and all that are being dumped, it, it has those modular parts, it has the receivers, it has the transmitters, and that is being used for making of the technology. Um, today, uh, so I think from a regulatory point of view, we need to look into these uh, small um, nuances of uh, technology, and especially supply chain uh, cybersecurity. Uh, that's uh, the comment. Thank you, thank you, uh, Sunjan. Can we hire from uh, Dr. Ture? Brief comments from you, sir. Yeah. Um I think there was two questions that I would pick here. One was on the testing of the security systems. Indeed, you can be assured that there, are, there is proper testing 
of those equipments. And there are specialists, uh, not only in the army, but also the civilians that are using uh, on the continent. Uh, I know a few of them. And they are working, uh, doing the right things. Um, uh, on the, the other question on the potential impl implication of space debris, uh, I take that question because I'm a satellite engineer and I know a lot about the uh, waste that is happening in the, in the system, uh, especially in the geostationary uh, orbit. And there are a lot of uh, satellites that are, have been uh, aged and there, what they do is to send them other in the outer space those who come back uh, to the Earth are actually destroyed uh, when they're entering the atmosphere. Most of them, most of the debris are become dust uh, because they are completely burned uh, before they reach the, the Earth uh, because of the big pressure they enter into uh, when they're entering the, uh, the Earth atmosphere. Uh, of course, there are a lot of debris in the, in the space of course, it's, the galaxy is so huge that uh, th 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 there are still uh, some of the big space uh, programs uh, like the, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, the, the space program that is the International Space Station, for instance, has had some cases where of debris uh, hitting some of the solar panels or things like that. Those those happen, but it's really minimal. Uh, uh, but uh, I believe that uh, the uh, issue of uh, of uh, space debris coming onto Earth uh, can be really relatively minimal. Uh, especially we are lucky, given the fact that uh, more than three quarters of the Earth is ocean. Actually, most of them will fall in the oceans. Uh, fortunately, that's what I will add here. Thank you, sir. Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll just um, respond very quickly to some of the questions that were raised. The first one was, can Africa lead and leapfrog the technological development? And I think some of the examples that were given are around intelligence. I think the answer is yes. And we've already seen very... Uh, concrete examples on how Africa has led when it comes to technological development. Dr. Ture earlier mentioned mobile money. Uh, the use of the mobile phone to deliver financial inclusion and access to financial services is something that started with M-Pesa and we're seeing multiple uh, evolutions of how that technology is continuing to uh, bridge uh, the, the financial gap but also bridging uh, the digital divide as well. And so I think you really hit the nail uh, uh, well because research and development is what is really going to take, the investments in research and development is what is really going to allow Africa to be able to lead but also to leapfrog uh, some of the uh, uh, development stages that we go through. Um, the other one was around, I think Iako, you asked about cybersecurity, Dr. Tura has touched on it, but what I can say, the legal frameworks that we have in place are not necessarily only focused on uh, uh, punitive uh, you know, measures. I think the, the, the reality is that when we have these legal frameworks, uh, many of them in many ways are designed, yes, to take care of what are the risks and concerns around how the technologies and the emerging technologies can be used, especially if they're not used in the right way. But uh, what is also being put in place uh, is also labs and test beds um, that allow for the way we can experiment and test with these different technologies. And particularly, I think the question you asked was around uh, cybersecurity th through our National Cybersecurity Agency we're putting in place these labs. And we're not only pl putting them in place at the agency level, it's also making sure in those industries that have critical technology systems that they have the capacity and ability to test uh, ahead of time because it's part of prevention and mitigation. Uh, what we're also doing through the National Cybersecurity Agency is to now going um, within schools, particularly in universities, because we want to be able to tap into the workforce that is being groomed, the talent that is being groomed, to ensure that they don't only have 
um, uh, the skills uh, theoretically, but also they have uh, the hands-on skills, and that's why we're establishing uh, some of these labs with uh, partners uh, such as Rodan Schwarz and, and Kaspersky. And so as, as we continue to uh, democratize access to these labs, I think we'll continue to see uh, more capabilities built across the board in terms of uh, being able uh, to test uh, these systems. But that is already ongoing. I think what we're trying to do is how do we prob probably ensure that it is scaled and it's accessible uh, to everyone, including the startups that are building solutions because we want to make sure when they bring their solutions and products to the market, they have already been tested to ensure that we are minimizing uh, some of the cyber crime risks that would come with it. But I think General uh, Yoshi uh, talked about it earlier very well. Much as we want to be prepared and ready, I think uh, we deal with a very fast evolving industry. And that what typically means is that yes, you can test and be comfortable, but also uh, cyber criminals are investing heavily in, in R&D. They, they, they are constantly finding ways where they can have new ways of, you know, uh, uh, of causing a bit of disorganization in the cyberspace. And so I think we have to match uh, that ability with which they're really uh, trying to, to, to come up with new crimes to ensure that we also have the capabilities to match that. And, and, and so it's always going to be a continuous investment and a continuous uh, training that has to happen. Um, I think Dr. Turo already touched on the issue around the potential implication of space debris. I think this is, this is where you have like the interagency on uh, space debris uh, that is coordinating all uh, countries uh, that are involved and, and keen to really uh, participate in the space industry. Our very own uh, Rwanda Space Agency is also uh, heavily involved in such conversations. And so a lot of those conversations will range from very short-term measures of preventing uh, possible collisions, but also thinking about reusable launch vehicles, uh, thinking about more durable material that will help with the orbiting of these satellites. And so even on our side as Rwanda, but also I think even what is happening with Africa, because we've already created the Africa Space Agency that is now based in Egypt, it allows to coordinate and ensure that we have a common voice as a continent in how we respond to such matters that are of importance to us. Uh, perhaps the final uh, one that I'll come to is the one raised by Lieutenant Colonel Morenzi, which was around things being expensive. I, and yes, I, I mean, they're expensive, but I think the reality is the starting point is how do we build capabilities, the know-how. Because when you build the know-how and then you invest in R&D, investments in R&D are always seeking to address the concern around affordability, around efficiency, around productivity. And so even when you look at the space industry, a case in point, the, the amount of money it used to require a nation to really build even uh, you know, satellite capabilities uh, 20 years ago versus today has significantly changed thanks to the investments in how we can make it more affordable uh, for countries to build such capabilities. But I think your question was around the purchasing power, which is very important. You still have a good number of Africans that live below the poverty line. Um, when Dr. Ture was still at ITU, I believe one of the measures that was put in place was 2% of uh, household income uh, should be uh, basically the standard measure of what the cost of data and internet should be. But then the qu question quickly becomes, for those living below the poverty line, what is the equivalent of 2%? And how much can that 2% afford them meaningful connectivity? And this is where then governments put in place and private sector measures to create subsidies, to create um, you know, programs like public Wi-Fi spaces, when you go to our city of Kigali, I think we have a garden space that has public Wi-Fi. Any day you pass by, it's going to be filled with people because they have access to connectivity and they're able to transact, the request for services, do what they want. And so there are multiple ways that we can address the issue of affordability beyond, um, you know, beyond simply looking at you know, the measure of do we lower the cost, because sometimes lowering the cost will also mean lowering how much they're able to afford but looking at public Wi-Fi um, uh, places where people can access it free of charge. At the same time, also looking at how do we allow for uh, installment payments, which is something that we're already experimenting with, because sometimes paying an upfront cost may be too expensive to pay a monthly cost versus if they're able to pay a weekly and daily cost which uh, they can uh, afford. And of course, that is coupled with how can we constantly figure out how to bring down the cost of access uh, for most of our citizens. 
So Patrick, I, th I think the very last one, I said last and this is the second time I'm saying last, but this is <laughs> <laughs> honestly the very last one. Um, I think it's the one, uh, the Lieutenant General from Uganda asked her, I think you were asking about drones. Um, what were some of the possible adverse effects we had to deal with uncertainties? I think the first one was the fact that as we explored uh, the use of drones, we're really talking about shared, share, shared space. How do we share space? And these were the regulations that were lacking globally. And so uh, one of the things we had to, to look at was, can we even figure out uh, a part within the country, and that is why uh, delivering medical products starting with blood uh, to rural areas was a good candidate for uh, as a use case application, because we're going to rural parts of the country where we would minimize at, at, at best um, even by setting up where the distribution hubs would be and allowing to minimize the concern that we had around if we don't have um, you know, uh, rules of engagement around how you share the space, how, how do we cater for that? I did mention earlier that what we came up with was what we called performance-based regulations. The reason we called it performance-based was we understand that for someone that is using drones to deliver blood versus someone that is using drones for um, you know, surveillance in a mining uh, um, you know, place or using drones to, um, you know, in, in a marshland, the risks are going to be different. And so we didn't want to come up with a one-size-fits-all set of regulations because what was really going to happen was that as more use cases came onto the market, we would find those that couldn't you know, find proper, a, a proper fit for what we we're trying to do. And so performance-based, really what it means for us is you come, you want to deliver blood, you want to use it for, um, uh, for, 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 uh, for, for marshland uh, irrigation. What we do is to say, okay, what are the risks involved with doing that activity? Then we sit down with this operator and figure out those risks that may be unique to each use case and then have mitigation measures that support. I think the final question you asked is how do, you, do we share this? I, I guess even my being invited here to share some of these stories is one of the ways that we continue to share some of these success stories. Dr. Turi mentioned Smart Africa platform where we're able, it has an, it's a knowledge hub where every country is able to share what has worked for them, but also what hasn't worked because we don't want to reinvent the wheel when we implement some of these innovations. Uh, General, final comments from you. Minister, I'll come back to you one last, last, last time. <laughs> this will be from me, but uh, before that, General. Yeah, just uh, one word about uh, the question of uh, early warning and in general, in, uh, the, the way, also the first question about how, how far can we trust uh, the, the information that uh, we develop through artificial intelligence and uh, uh, new technologies. Uh, there is a problem. So there definitely is a problem because uh, you may lose the ability to know how exactly you reached the conclusion. And, uh, but uh, if you repeat the same uh, process again and again and again, you get uh, results that you can rely upon, then you uh, begin to believe that you can really trust the, the results you get. Now, uh, in some of the uh, cases we did uh, practice, for example, with Iron Dome, we have 96% success in intercepting uh, incoming rockets. This is, we rely on, uh, but that doesn't mean that because we are so cautious, we give up on the man on, in the loop. In no, uh, none of these uh, systems we give, on, give up on the man in the loop. We, just, we still keep the man in the loop, uh, just to make sure that uh, if something goes wrong, the, he can intervene. Uh, we did, uh, I recommend those uh, military people who want to, to see more uh, in detail uh, research, uh, we just published uh, research about what, does, what would have happened, speaking about early warning, if we had artificial intelligence in Pearl Harbor or if we had uh, artificial intelligence in uh, Yom Kippur, in the debacle that we had uh, in Israel. And uh, the result is uh, promising, but uh, still keeps the need to rely on human beings. And uh, the artificial intelligence has some uh, advantages. First of all, it can reach all the information. Secondly, it can question many of the uh, uh, basic assumptions you make and you never come back to che check them. You believe that they are still value, uh, valid, and even if they are not. 
So the artificial intelligence can check it. And thirdly, it doesn't have emotions. So it's not committed to what it said yesterday. It can say everything is something else, everything is something else, and this is critically important in making assessments. And, uh, but that being said, it's not, uh, it cannot replace the human being uh, involved in the, in the process, and we have to keep it. I'll stop at that, and I'll just add one more word before we finish. Because yes, sir. Uh, my impression from what uh, everybody else was saying here, especially the minister and the Dr. Ture, is that the potential is immense for Africa. Uh, the awareness is there, and the readiness to invest in, in, in making it good and the potential is there. I was very impressed with what my uh, panelists colleague panelists were saying in this respect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, General. In fact, I'll pick from that point you mentioned. This session is uh, meant to end at 10.30, so uh, as we wind up, I wanted to take a final shot from the Minister, and I wanted to pick from uh, what the General has just said. Um, immense potential for Africa. Of course, for Rwanda, you have been for Vice City Innovation for Rwanda. There's actually an interesting uh, historic relationship between Rwanda and uh, the whole digital revolution. Um, at a time when uh, most of the generals, uh, RDF generals and senior officers in this room were fighting to put uh, an end to the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994, uh, there are major developments that happened that have shaped and in fact became a launch pad for the entire digital revolution. One of them is that uh, internet, uh, became commercialized and accessible worldwide and widely in 1994. Sometimes we think it has been around for much longer. Uh, in fact, the World Wide Web was invented in 1992, uh, but it's only until 1994 that there was enough technology for uh, an end user to effectively connect the internet from wherever they are. So 1994, uh, we can say internet uh, became available to all of us. The second one is that although mobile networks had existed, uh, GSM was also uh, established in 1994. And uh, GSM uh, made it easier for countries like ours to be able to have mobile networks and, and be able to be part of the digital revolution. And fast forward, uh, we are now uh, you know, in uh, 2023. Uh, as a Minister of ICT, you talked about the Proof of Concept Hub. I wanted you to give us your parting shot in terms of where do we go from here? How do we develop this potential uh, to realize uh, the benefits of uh, the emerging digital energies for the continent? Minister, your, part, your, your final parting shot. I think, thank you very much, Patrick. I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough question to even summarize everything we've had, but um, to respond to that, um, I think it comes back to the 1.4 billion market that we have. It's already a good enough market if we are able to join forces and efforts uh, to really build the right capabilities in how we can you know, leverage the impact of emerging technologies. And I think one thing perhaps that maybe we didn't um, you know, discuss a lot on this panel is that impact can be varying in our particular context, context as Africa in the sense that in certain places you have equity, other places you will not. And so I think as we, as we go forward, one, we have a market that we can tap into, and I believe yesterday you had great conversations with the, um, with the panel that was really looking at the continental free trade area and, and what the opportunities are. For us, in a digital sense, where do we want to see more coordinated, um, you know, uh, partnerships and, and effort across the continent. One, it starts with regulations. Um, I think earlier you did, the, uh, Her Excellency, the cyber diplomat, talked about um, most countries in Africa having, um, you know, uh, data governance laws. Last year, when Rwanda was putting in place our data protection and privacy law, we realized we had about 26 countries that had data protection and privacy laws. Now, you still have another 
over 20 countries that don't have that. There's an absence of that. And what that really means, if we start to trade, digitally trade amongst ourselves, is we start to have cross-border data sharing happening, there's going to be a good half of the continent where there's an absence of such regulations. But then the other good half that has them, they're not necessarily aligned because they feel like different pieces of regulations. So I think it's about time that we start to think about how do we harmonize these regulations? And I think we have very good examples like EU where you have the GDPR uh, that, that they've been able to put in place together and makes it an attractive market. When most people are coming to invest on the continent, they'll probably not look at Rwanda's 13 million market, or even if they're looking at Nigeria's that is over that. But in essence, if we're able to have these coordinated policy and regulatory frameworks, then our 1.4 billion market becomes very attractive. And I think that's one thing that even living here, we can collectively do as we think about uh, the impact of digital technologies. And I think the final one will be on infrastructure. We've talked about the different investments that are happening in infrastructure. How do we close the conversation on access to meaningful infrastructure in the next five years? The pace at which we make infrastructure investments, when we calculate, we almost have another 50 years be before we close that gap. And I think if we really want to lead and leapfrog, we don't have 20, 50 years from now to still be doing uh, you know, very slow paced implementation of closing the infrastructure gap. So for me, those are the two key things I feel like moving away from this conversation we can do together. And when we come back next year, at least we have one of them, which is regulations, uh, ticked off um, uh, the list of things that we need to coordinate. With that, we come to the end of this session. Uh, in session one, we're reminded that when you are not on the table, you are on the menu. <laughs> that is as much true for everything else as it is for uh, emerging digital technologies. Let's strive to make the most of this and truly, truly be part of this revolution. On this note, I hand over to the MC a more uh, final round of applause for our panelists as we go back uh, to our seats. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Patrick, for a very good moderation. Uh, it is now time for the tea break. We are coming back at 11. I'm requesting the first three rows to exit using the left exit, and then the rest can wait for a short while before they exit to the right. Thank you very much. So let's be here at 11 sharp. Thank you.